Well, dear Heavenly Father, what a joy and privilege it is to uh, share this time that we have together in the study of your word. And as we look at this passage of scripture tonight, I just pray that you will uh, speak to us through your Holy Spirit, through your word, and that you will open up our ears and eyes to what you have to say to us. And we just ask that um, we'd be attentive to um, not only what you have to say, but responsive to uh, the correction and the um, direction that you're uh, going to give us through your word. And we Again, thank you for this book of John and what we've had so far this year and what we're headed forward to this spring. And so we just pray that you, um, again, uh, speak to us through your word. And it's in uh, your son's name that we ask this. Amen. Well, the word comfort is defined as a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint or the easing or alleviation of a person's feelings of grief or distress. Uh, But I would say that physical comfort is sometimes uh, taken for granted. If you ask Mark McWilliams, uh, when do you think about your thermostat? It's only time you think about it is when it's not working, when your air isn't working in the summer or your furnace isn't working in the winter. Uh, He is a shameless plug for United Heating and Cooling. So, Um, but comfort is something that we all desire. Uh, think too about how much comfort is marketed today. There's comfort dental, comfort in, comfort fabric softener, uh, not to mention other types of things, comfort shoes, toilet seats, diapers. And don't we usually try to do everything that we can to make sure that people who can't fend for themselves are at least comfortable? Uh, you know, a newborn baby or, or somebody in the hospital. Um, and don't we all within ourselves also have some type of comfort zone? If someone gets too close to us, maybe we withdraw and we back up into our own comfort zone. But what about spiritual comfort? I think that's a different story. Uh, Think how much people struggle to find comfort during times of doubt, times of worry, times of loneliness. Um, You know, when Job was being comforted by his friends, even they didn't know exactly what to do or what to say. It says uh, this, that for seven days they sat seven days and seven nights, and no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. And so in today's passage, and why don't we go ahead and see what Jesus had to say about being comforted. So if you would, please open up your Bibles to John chapter 13. We're in the last part of 13th chapter of John. And several years ago, we did study the book of Isaiah in an entire year in BSF. And one of the big themes of that book was this same idea of spiritual comfort. Isaiah 40 says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Isaiah 61 says, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness for prisoners. Uh, But tonight in this last part of John 13, and if you remember um, last week, Jesus gave Judas's exit orders, uh, basically. And so in John 13, 27, he says, what you're about to do, do quickly. Uh, Judas leaves, and then verse 30 was a reminder of the blackness of the sin of the heart of Judas, and it said, and it was night. Uh, But it wouldn't be until verse 31, when Judas was gone, that Jesus would then begin to address the 11 disciples. The hypocrite was off to do his deed, and the cross was only mere hours away, and Jesus couldn't help but think about returning to his full glory. Uh, So Jesus turns to the 11 remaining disciples and gives them what we think of as his farewell address. Um, And Jesus begins here, will not finish until the end of chapter 16. Uh, So we'll spend three more weeks in this uh, discourse. And even though the cross was full of sin bearing and full of wrath and would be a complete humiliation, Jesus would be glorified on the cross. The word glory means this, praise, honor, distinction, renown, worshipful praise, thanksgiving, And and I noticed four statements about this glorification in these opening few verses. Number one was in verse 31, right at the beginning. It says, now is the Son of Man glorified. And here John gives us the highest divine viewpoint of things, just like he always does. There's nothing quite like this in the other gospel accounts. John's always trying to show us that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And so how is Jesus' death going to be glory for him? How does the cross give glory to Jesus Christ? You see, when you look at the Lord Jesus, when he spoke of his own death, he looked at it neither as martyrdom nor as a disgrace. 
And even though it wasn't anything like his baptism or the transfiguration, there was glory in the cross. Why? Because through it, he would give life for the sake of the sinner. Acts 3.13 says this, The God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus when you handed him over to be killed. There was glory in the fact that Jesus' death would purchase salvation by satisfying the demands of God's justice. The death of Christ destroyed the power of sin and death. In the words of Genesis 3, Satan may have struck Jesus' heel, but Jesus crushed the head of Satan. And not only was Jesus glorified in the cross in his death, we also see that God was glorified too. So number one, Jesus is glorified. Number two, the Father is glorified. Look at the last part of verse 31. God is glorified in him. What a theme, the glory of God, the glory of the Father. He was glorified by Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. You see, the work of Christ was for the glory of the Father. Think about how many of God's attributes were magnified at Calvary. There's the holiness of God, where the Father manifests his full wrath and the hatred of sin as he turned his back on the Son. We see the power of God as he pours out wrath on sin. You see the justice of God as Jesus took our place and, Jesus, and God declares us righteous based on his work. There's the faithfulness of God as we see even prophecy fulfilled in precision. We also see the love of God as he gave up his only begotten Son for the world. And so we've seen the, the Son of Man's glory, the Father's glory, and then verse, uh, the third one, verse 32, is yeah, if God is glorified in him. You combine that with the qualifier of the last verse, God will glorify the Son in himself. So not only is Jesus returning to heaven as the Son of Man in a glorified human body, he's also the Son of God. Acts 2.33 says Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God. Now there was a certain type of glory in the, Christ, in, in the cross, but there was also a whole lot of glory to follow after the cross, right? And lastly, the fourth statement, back to verse 32, God will glorify him at once. Uh, the New American Standard uses the word immediately. Now, you might think of it as Jesus' resurrection and ascension uh, follows shortly uh, behind the cross, but to God it was at once. For the disciples, it may have seen for a few days, but to God, we think of it as immediately. And so from these first two verses, we see the mystery of this father-son relationship and the glory of each part. The glory of the Son of Man, God the Father's glory, Jesus' glorified body, and four, since it was happening immediately, Jesus knew that he would soon leave his disciples. And so he encourages them with these words. Verse 33, my children, my dear children. It's a term of affection. Technia is the word, and it's the only time it's ever used in the Gospel of John, probably because Judas is now gone. And so Jesus wants his disciples to know that he's thinking about his tekiah, his dear children. He doesn't want them to forget that they were his children because he'd soon be leaving. Verse 33, he says, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I will tell you now where I'm going, you cannot come. It might sound familiar to you. If you remember back in chapter 8, Jesus told the Jewish leaders the same thing. Except five chapters back, he added these solemn words, you will die in your sin. So yes, he would be leaving, but no, the disciples would not be dying in their sin. And since he was leaving, he wanted to comfort them, and that would come in the form of a commandment. Verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must also love one another. Now, as we saw in our uh, lesson this week, this was not a brand new commandment, was it? Uh, all the way back in the Old Testament law, people were commanded to love each other. Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. We looked at that. Uh, but the way that Jesus is stating this, I think there's a deeper intensity of this love that we don't see in the Old Testament. In the original, we see self-love is assumed. It's as yourself, which is the standard. But now Jesus' new command is based on a completely new formula. Notice it's not based on self-love. It's me measured by Christ's love, which was demonstrated by self-sacrifice. We've seen this before. Notice too, it does not say, show love for one another, but it says, love one another. Why? Because love is the badge of the Christian discipleship. That's verse 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now, obviously, when I wear my badge, people know, even little kids know that I'm a cop, right? And so it is with believers. Love identifies followers of the Lord. Love marks a true Christian. It was John the Apostle, the writer of this book, who was known in the early church about this concern about love. 
The New Testament historian Jerome talks about John in his extreme old age, so old that he had to be carried into the church. And in those meetings, all he would say was this, little children love one another. And after hearing that over and over, the people finally asked, John, why do you always say this? To which he replied, it's the Lord's command, and if this alone be done, it's right. And so it was Jesus who was the one who gave this command, love one another. But then the conversation he has with Peter confirms his love for him because Peter was worried about where this conversation was going. Think about it. Jesus had just said, I'll be with you only a short time. You'll look for me where I'm going. You cannot come. Those are not the words Peter wanted to hear. And so he asked Jesus, verse 36, Lord, where are you going? And what we see from Peter reflected what probably all the disciples were thinking. Uh, this was their unwillingness to accept the fact that Jesus was going to leave them. Uh, remember when Peter made that great confession back in Matthew 16? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was right after that, Jesus starts talking about the cross, and Peter rebukes Jesus, to which he replies, what? Get behind me, Satan, right? You do not have in mind the things of God. And so this time, Jesus answers Peter here in verse 36, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Now about that last part, you will follow later. Now granted, Peter and the rest, for now, will all be defectors. And yes, Peter will make his denials, at least three of them. We'll see that. But that promise, you will follow, it gave Peter hope. Hope of perseverance, hope during persecution, hope of future glory with Christ. The first part of that is what Peter, and his unwillingness to let go, is how why he responds impulsively. Verse 37, Lord, why can't I follow you now? And then with an overestimation of a promise, I will lay down my life for you. Listen to what Peter said in the other gospel accounts. Matthew 26, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Mark 14, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Luke 22, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And with such an Ironic question, Jesus answers Peter, verse 38, Will you really lay down your life for me? The irony here is that Jesus would soon be laying down his life for Peter. And then Jesus continues in verse 38, I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. In Luke 22, Jesus adds, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but as I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail you. And when you have turned back, strengthen the brothers. And after those shocking words, Peter goes through the rest of the dialogue without saying another word. But what was it that eventually led to Peter's failure? It was Peter's self-confidence in his flesh that got him there, right? And so what's the lesson or the principle that we can take away from the failure of Peter? I think the one that you might want to write down for this first division is this, and that is that self-confidence eventually leads to self-destruction. Self-confidence eventually leads to self-destruction. If anyone remembers the famous runner Jim Fix from the 1970s, it has been nearly 50 years since he authored uh, the best-selling book, Complete Book of Running. He ran 80 miles a week, uh, appeared to be in peak fitness for his age, but in 1984, uh, a tragic incident happened along a deserted uh, Vermont road that took his life. Jim Fix, at only the age of 52, died of a heart attack he was out on his daily run. And his wife later said that she was certain Jim had no idea that he suffered from a heart condition. Why? Because, for one, he refused to get regular checkups. And number two, doctors speculated that his heart was so strong that he may have not have felt the normal pains associated with heart problems. You see, you have to be sensitive to your weaknesses. And so Jim Fix couldn't feel the intensity of his problem. In fact, he had a history of heart problems. His own father had died younger than he had. But here's the problem. We all have a heart problem. We all have a family history. It's called being born into this world with a sin problem, right? Each one of us has a deep family history of sin. And we must not rely on our flesh to keep us out of harm's way. Because where did Peter's boasting get him? It made him look even more foolish, right? Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction. Maybe Peter should have listened to Jesus when he was in the garden, when he told his disciples, watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. So where do you need to keep watching and praying so that you don't fall into temptation? Where do we need to watch and pray? 
Think about the things we talked about last week. Trifling with sin, making light of evil, allowing sin to entice us. And so where are we willing to love as Jesus loved because we're failing? Where are we failing to do that because we're relying on ourselves? Uh, Jesus found his greatest delight in doing the Father's will all the way to the end. And so do you and I prioritize God's desire as our highest achievement? Is his will our greatest delight? I mean, maybe you need some comfort. And I'm not talking about someone who's going to tell you that it's okay to, to, yeah. to sin, uh, but rather someone who can relieve the burden of sin by his blessed forgiveness. That is spiritual comfort. And that comfort only comes through Jesus Christ, the ultimate comforter seen here in chapter 14. And so we'll uh, look at it as this chapter uh, makes a break here. And just remember, it's just a chapter break. So if you remember, the text flows right through here. Uh, there's no break in the dialogue. There's no break in the setting or anything else. Remember, Peter has just told uh, is just told that he wasn't going to deny Jesus, and the disciples are dumbfounded that their leader, um, seemingly the strongest of the bunch, he would not only fail their Lord, uh, but he would do it three times. And so, when the disciples should have been the ones lending their support and comfort and encouragement to Jesus and give him the emotional support that he needs for what he's going to face, instead it was Jesus whose heart was full of selfless love, self-denial. It was him being a support for the helpless disciples. And so their Savior begins to comfort them. and does it once again, just like back in 1344, in the form of a command. This time it's a threefold command. Number one, verse one, do not let your hearts be troubled. Number two, trust in God. Number three, trust also in me. And so the first command, don't let your hearts be troubled. You, You might look at that and think of the meaning behind the word for troubled was actually just like we saw last week, the, mean, the word means to shake or to stir up. So ever the compassionate Savior, Jesus sympathized with their sorrow, just like Isaiah 53 said that he would. And so the first commandment was in the form of the negative, do not. But the second command is in the positive, trust in God. And there's two ways to really translate that. Uh, the first is the way the New American Standard has it as a command, trust in God. Do it, trust him. And number two, the way the King James trans It's it. Ye believe in God. And what that means is Jesus is like this. Listen, guys, you have found relief and trouble uh, in the arms of God before. And if you do that, if you can trust God, then trusting me is the next logical step, which would be his third command at the end of verse 1. Trust also in me. And in that is nothing more than another undisputed claim that he is God in the flesh, right? Do you believe in God, don't you? Then trust me as well. Notice, too, it's not trusting in nothing. Faith needs an object to believe in. That object is Jesus Christ. And so now, after three commands, Jesus begins to offer comfort in a different way by revealing to them that their separation from him would be brief. Verse 2, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So let's break this down. Obviously, a reference to heaven. Notice here it's described as a house. Uh, other places in the Bible, heaven is described as a country, a city, a kingdom, paradise, a place of rest. But here, Jesus is preparing to leave. He comforts his disciples by saying this, when they get to where he's at, they'll finally be home. Isn't that a great feeling? To be home? I mean, even going on a great vacation, no matter where you go, when you come home, it always feels good, right? But notice it's not home, just home. It's my father's house. In the Old Testament, uh, that was his temple. had to be cleaned out in Matthew 23. Look, your house is left to you desolate. And so Jesus now at the end of his ministry transfers that term to his father's dwelling place on high. The place where God himself abides. That's where there is uninterrupted worship. And now even translated in some places as many mansions, the NIV has it correctly as many rooms. The idea expressed is that of a loving father adding a room to his original home so that his child can be close to him. Next, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. He's not sending out this to the lowest bidder, right? The Lord himself is the one who obtained the right by his death on the cross for every believing sinner to enter heaven. He is the one who is completing all the necessary work to secure for his people a permanent place for them. And so if he's the one doing the work necessary to prepare this place for us, then the next reasonable thing to do would be to bring us there. That's verse 3. If I go there to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. Notice it's the Lord who's coming in person to take us to his Father's house. 
It seems probable Jesus might be referring to the events Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that those who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now there's a section in your notes on the second coming of Christ. You might read that diligently. Uh, see in verse 3, I will come back and take you to be with me. Uh, what I see here is Christ personally coming for his group of followers to take them home. And so having set this promise before them, Jesus tells them, verse 4, you know the way to the place where I am going. He's already told them he's returning to the Father, and so it was expected they should know the way. And But by this time, with all this new information, their minds just weren't clear. Keep in mind, too, just a few verses back, Jesus told them, you can't follow now, but you will follow later. And now he tells them that they know the way. And so if they are thoroughly confused at this point, Thomas speaks up. Uncharacteristically, Thomas is uh, the one speaking up, and Peter is the one silent, probably still contemplating his denials that Jesus predicted. Uh, it's Thomas that says this in verse 5. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And we'll just stop for a minute, and let's look at Thomas, because he often gets a bad rap. Uh, what's the first thing you think of when you think of Thomas? Doubting, Doubting right? Uh, Doubting Thomas. And, and so we get that nickname from the account at the end of this book. Uh, tradition tells us very little about Thomas. Um, we know he preached. Some say that he preached as far as India. Uh, one tradition says that he died when they took a spear and rammed it all the way through him because of his faith in Christ. It's a very fitting climax for the one who is told to feel the spear mark in his Lord's side. Um, do you know something? Without Thomas and his persistent questions, we would have never heard the statement we hear in the last part of John, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. It's the same way here because Jesus' response to Thomas here in John 14 might well be considered the clearest, most distinct, most authoritative, most precise, and most exclusive statement by our Lord. Uh, if you were to go to my church and you wanted the Wi-Fi code, it's John 14, 6, which is the, the verse that we're looking at right now. Verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is now the sixth I am statement in John's gospel account. See, Jesus alone is the way to God, and there is no other way. He's not a way. He isn't one of many ways. He doesn't show the way. He didn't just know the way. He is the way. It's a definite article in the Greek. A definite article is used to indicate a specific thing, something that's exclusive. Jesus is the only way to the Father. Acts 4.12 comes to mind. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name in heaven given by men which we must be saved. And not only is he the way, he is the way, the way in to the Father. Just like back in John 10, he said, I am the gate. He is the way in, he is the road itself into the Father. Uh, Jesus uh, said, I am the gate. J.C. Ryle said this, Jesus is himself the door, the ladder, and the road. And it is because early believers taught this very truth, the believers themselves were then referred to as the way. Uh, six times in the book of Acts, believers, Christians, are referred to as the way. So not only is Jesus the way, but he's also the truth. Christ is the full and final revelation of God. Adam and Eve believed the devil's lie, and ever since then, man has been groping around looking for truth, right? Pilate voiced his question of the ages when he asked sarcastically, what is truth? But truth isn't found in some philosophy. Rather, it's found in the man, Jesus Christ. Truth not only reveals about God, truth exposes man. In Romans 1, when Paul's giving his indictment on the human race, he says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So not only is Jesus Christ the only way and the only truth, he's also life. Jesus Christ possesses the very life of God. He is answer to man's mortality. Only in Christ do men face death. They go to the grave shouting the words of Hosea 13, 14. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Only in Christ can you do that. Christ is the emancipator from death, not only physical death, but spiritual death. Ephesians 2, 1 says we were dead in our transgressions and sins. But according to John 5, 24, the one who believes in Christ has passed from death to life. And so Jesus says he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. He finishes up the statement with, no one comes to the Father except through me. Again, we see the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. 
No wonder Christians are called intolerant. But you know what? In reality, we're just ideologically intolerant. Truth be told, it's not really even Christians who are being intolerant. It's actually God who is. Uh, here's a definition of intolerance. An unwillingness or refusal to tolerate or accept contrary opinions or beliefs. Someone can believe all they want in any kind of cult or ism that suits them, but unless they repent and believe in Christ, God will be the one intolerant of them. That's why the Bible says, that's why the passage says, and don't be afraid of that message. It's just the truth. And the thing about the truth is it's always exclusive. It's always dogmatic. It's always intolerant of non-truth. And so I think there's a principle here that's consistent with the last verse. The principle is this. Scripture stresses that Jesus is the only hope of salvation for the world. Scripture stresses that Jesus is the only hope of salvation to the world. When Jesus came the first time, the world had 4,000 years to discover the bankruptcy and limitations of every other man-made religion. Buddha had come and gone. The Greek philosophers were dead and buried. The Indian mystics were no more. But Jesus came and he spoke with authority and he performed unexplainable miracles. You only need to read the Sermon on the Mount or the Olivet Discourse to discover truth being set before humanity. But Jesus didn't merely teach truth. Not only did he show truth, rather he was the truth. He is the truth. Jesus was dogmatic. You know, the world has such a bad connotation when we use that word in postmodern way of thinking. But dogmatism really isn't that bad of a thing. Two plus two really does equal four. Uh, our house is over 30 years old, and a few years ago we had to spend several thousands of dollars fortifying our foundation. Why? Because our house is built on a steep hill, and we had to secure it into the bedrock. They had to dig down deep into the ground to stop this from shifting around. Truth is the bedrock of our faith. Yeah. Truth is important. Truth will save your life. Do you want to know the mother of all politically incorrect statements? Here it is. Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Even the mere hint of this it, it causes people to cringe and shudder. Most more will become irate over this declaration. They'll spew accusations. Intolerant, narrow, arrogant, narrow-minded, bigot, hateful. People are willing to tolerate any kind of anything outside of that except the one true faith that claims to be uniquely true. Currently, only 12% of Americans claim that their religion is the only true faith. Even more shocking, in a 2008 poll, and this is 15, 16 years ago, 57% of so-called evangelical church attenders said that they believed many religions can lead to eternal life. And so it's not even a foregone conclusion in many evangelical churches that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. And so you have to ask yourself, what about you? What are your thoughts about this passage? What are your beliefs about the truth of Scripture? You know, if Jesus is just one of many possible options, it shouldn't surprise us that Christians aren't witnessing. Why bother? We shouldn't have to worry if any old religion will work, right? How can a person have a right relationship with God? That is the question that religions try to answer. But our culture is attempting to move the answer to that question to an area of objective truth, to an area of opinion. And so how will you respond to the culture when it tells you that there's no objective truth? It comes down to the issue of who is worthy of trust? Who has been worthy of, of, of this trust? What about our cultural gurus, the entertainment industry? Uh, manifested, have they manifested any type of trust? Are universities proven trustworthy? Do our public educators speak in agreement? Who are we going to trust? If you're confused about the hard sayings of Jesus, what plan do you have to figure them out? Will you ask God for help? If so, search the scriptures to find those answers. The Bible is the only way to determine what God says is truth. Do we believe that? So my challenge to you is to take those cares to God and have him be the one to comfort you. That's still the overall theme of this passage that Jesus does here. He comforts, and he does that with his own statement to full deity by pointing the disciples back uh, in the next verse. And so John 14, 7 says this, If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. 
Now, the disciples' problem was not that they didn't know the Father. It was they hadn't realized that they knew him all along. And so Jesus reassures him, from now on you do know him and you have seen him. What this does, it points us to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. You know, some different styles for the Holy Spirit, one of those different names that we come to is the name of Comforter. And so I think there's something the way Jesus talks to Peter and to Thomas and the rest of the disciples that shows the comfort that he can give. It seems from this reaction that we see, maybe Thomas got that comfort. Maybe. Uh, But Philip? Philip still wasn't satisfied. Uh, Look at his reaction. Verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Now, obviously, this request revealed certain lack of knowledge on Philip's part. It wasn't enough for Philip to believe. He wanted to see something. His faith was weak, and he wanted a sign. He wanted a substitute for faith. I need to see I need to see, I need to see. And I think it's the same way with so many people today. Um, It's typical faithless idea. It's a contrast between faith and sight. So look at Jesus' response, verse 9. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Now the idea behind this is the Greek word pathos. It means an expression evoking a fear of pity or compassion. There's compassion in the voice of Jesus. Philip, don't you know me? Can you imagine the heartbreak of Jesus? He just spent three years pouring his life into these 11 guys, and none of them show an ounce of faith when they need it the most. It's the night before his death, and they still don't know who he is. It's a sad thing when you realize after all this, the repeated displays of Jesus' deity, they still don't get it. But you know what? No one ever promised that ministry would be easy. And so if you're ever discouraged by someone that you've discipled, don't feel bad because it wasn't easy for Jesus either. And so Jesus tries once again to explain, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The force of this was this. Haven't you figured out who I am yet? Philip, you're staring at me in the face, asking me to show you God. Open your eyes. You've been looking at me for three years. You know what Jesus did? He went as far as he could with them, and he turns it over to the Holy Spirit. I think it's the same thing we need to do as some people today. We pour into the lives of people, and then we leave it to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus finishes his statement to Philip with a rhetorical question. It's really the key to everything. Remember, Philip had just said, I need to see. I need to see. I want to see. Show me. Show me. And Jesus' response to the next phrase, verse 10, don't you believe? The idea is that of faith. Faith is not only the means of appropriating salvation, it's the very essence of living out the Christian life. Faith is essential to living out the Christian life. Verse 10, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Christ was in the Father. The Father was in him. It's the mysterious blending of the Trinity that we're not going to understand. The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And so here we see the union of Jesus' words and his works. Think about it. Jesus' words turned into works because his words were words of power. Lazarus, come forth. Be healed. Take up your mat and walk. Your sins are forgiven. Verse 11 goes right along with that. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. This is the same teaching from back in chapter 5 and chapter 10. Philip, how else can I show you? How else can I tell you? I am God manifest. Believe it by my words. Believe it by my works. But you better believe it. Look at the power in verse 12. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. If you believe on me, you'll do the works that I've done. What's he saying? And then add this on there. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. What is he saying? That anyone can do anything like Jesus if Jesus goes to the Father? Why? Because when Jesus went to the Father, he sent his Holy Spirit here, right? And although we can't see Jesus with our physical eyes, It's still better to have the Holy Spirit with every believer than it is to have Jesus in one place at a time. Because the Holy Spirit is actually Christ living in every believer. That's why he's called the Spirit of Christ. And Jesus is simply giving them more comfort by telling them this. He just told them that he's not leaving. And so they're thinking they're going to lose everything. They're going to lose their power. And Jesus tells them they will do even greater things. What does that mean? Greater things. Is it greater in extent? but maybe not greater in power. Greater in extent, certainly, 
With the multiplication of believers over the last 2,000 years, there have been more things done in the name of Jesus than he did himself. Since the Holy Spirit came, we have seen more in number, sure. Never was the gospel shared outside of Palestine during the life of Christ until Jesus sent his spirit. But now the gospel is spreading worldwide to an extent that Jesus never experienced in his own ministry. But what else? Is it greater in power? Well, let's consider one example. Consider the physically blind versus the spiritually blind. When Jesus healed the physical eyes of a, a physically blind person, they could see physically, they couldn't see before, for the rest of their life, maybe 30 or 40 years. But when you lead someone to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that is something that lasts forever in eternity. You're taking a person who is spiritually blind, and they don't see their sin, they don't understand their spiritual condition, and in a sense, you get to be a part of that healing process that lasts forever. And, and so in that similar work, a similar physically blind, except now we're seeing a spiritually blind person led into something forever. And then finally, these last two verses really go together, verse 13 and 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son of Man may bring glory to the Father. Verse 14, you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. We can take comfort in these words. As long as we put our supplications, our requests into Christ's hands, our prayers will not be in vain. If we send our petitions through our heavenly advocate, then he promises they will succeed. Does that mean we simply tack on, in Jesus' name, at the end of our prayers, and the law be answered? What does praying in Jesus' name mean? First, it means we pray in his person. We pray in as if Jesus were doing the asking, if Jesus were praying that himself. Second, we ask God through the merit of his son, through the merit or the worthiness of Jesus. He is worthy, and we ask God based on that authority. Third, we ask to seek his will and his glory. So we seek God's will and God's glory in our prayers. That means what we pray for is in accordance with God's perfect will, and that will be for his glory. So we are asking, seeking exactly what Jesus seeks, setting aside our own will, seeking God's will and God's glory. That should really clean up some of our prayers, shouldn't it? Yeah. You know, the only way to know his will comes from what? Spending time with him in his word, communing with him. Right. And when we do that, we'll find out that his will is and will be comforted. And so what can we take away from this? I think there's a principle here. Comfort comes from knowing the will of the Father. Comfort comes from knowing the will of the Father. So you might ask yourself, what do I need? Do I need comfort? Or do I need God's will? Or do I need both? They're both found in communion with God, in His Word, and in prayer. So how will you seek God's will this week? How will you seek to find out the will of God? Will it be through a daily commitment to the study of John? Maybe studying the Bible is a challenge to find the time to do the work. Don't you think God will bless that time? The care and compassion that God gives us is worth it. It's worth our meditation. It's worth our time. It's worth our energy. Jesus said to his disheartened disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Later he said, neither let it be afraid. So what is the only remedy to our fears? The fears that we all experience, we are to believe that Jesus has told us is true because of who he is. He is the very incarnation of God. And so what is it that we have to fear? Do you trust the Lord Jesus? Do you focus on him rather than maybe some potential loss that you might have? The question then becomes not whether or not we will obey, but how will we obey? So what area of your life is in need of obedience? If you would start with just one area of your life and pray that the will of God, seeking his glory, he will answer. So what's the final thought of the night? It goes back to what true spiritual comfort is all about and how we find it. And so that final summary principle is this. True comfort is trusting faith in God's will. True comfort is a trusting faith in God's will.
I'm going to close with the words of Fanny Crosby's hymn, "'Twill All Be Right at Last." And she says this, Pray on, pray on with steadfast hope, for thou shalt yet prevail. Ask what thou wilt, and it will be done. The promise cannot fail. Cling firmly to the solid rock and hold the anchor fast. The clouds will break and light will come. It will all be right at last. It was written by a woman who was blind all 94 years of her life on earth. But her hope was, it will all be right at last. Do we believe that? Let's pray. Well, dear Heavenly Father, as we look at this passage, we are um, comforted by your words uh, that all will be right and that you will make all things right. And we thank you that we get a chance to look at your second coming and we have hope uh, for eternity. I uh, pray that as we continue to study the rest of this chapter and um, as we read through the notes and as we uh, could take uh, these principles and apply them to our lives, that you would be working in our lives and that you would be uh, the one that's glorified. And so as we ask that uh, as you bring us back safely next week, that uh, as you answer our requests, God, that we would be praying, uh, seeking your will, seeking your glory uh, through the merit and person of your son, Jesus Christ. And it is his name we, we do pray. Amen.